Uh, I just, I wish you all just the very best of safety and health in these crazy times that we're in. Um, by way of very quick background, um, I am an attorney at the law firm of DeFrancesco Bateman and a bunch of other names. And uh, I, I uh, specialize in education law. Uh, I, ex I exclusively uh, do work for colleges, universities, school districts, boards of education. And um, I also uh, represent uh, families um, in the area of um, IDEA, students with disabilities, 504, et cetera. Um, with regard to the work that I do um, in education law, it is uh, soup to nuts, whatever needs to be done in a school district, that's what I do. Um, and um, I had the, the privilege of meeting Naomi, uh, oh gosh, I guess it was uh, last summer, maybe it was the summer before that, in, in a, uh, um, uh, a seminar that I did on, on website accessibility. Um, so uh, I was, I was uh, um, honored to be asked to spend a few minutes with you today just to give some insights into accessibility in these times. And uh, these times is, is certainly uh, uh, crazy, crazy. So, um, the, the biggest lesson that I ever learned um, in the area of um, disability law um, and, and actually anti-discrimination law, whether we're talking about any of the um, categories regarding disabilities, is that um, the attitude towards accessibility issues should be foundational as opposed to a feature or a supplement or an afterthought. And the main reason I, I raise that is that I'm afraid that uh, whether we um, deal with this issue anecdotally or even from any kind of a uh, scientific uh, data-driven uh, conclusion, I think we can agree that uh, accessibility issues in, in uh, public institutions, whether they be school districts, uh, whether they be a higher education or governmental entities of any kind, tend to be more an afterthought. Uh, and um, as opposed to the concept of accessibility being thought of immediately upon any kind of program, um, innovation, uh, service that is going on. Uh, we tend to think about accessibility issues uh, later. And um, in the interests of provoking you, um, I would argue that it really should be an issue that is dedicated to a foundational um, uh, point of view. Now, that said, I would like to take that um, uh, a step further. I think, I think the term is further. Yes, it's instead of farther. I would like to take the, the uh, concept of foundational uh, accessibility one step further. And I would argue that as of April 14th, 2020, we should be thinking of accessibility issues in a transformational uh, way and a foundational way. And here's why. Uh, we all uh, aspire to the hope that what we're going through now is going to be in time, uh, is going to change and we will get back to some semblance of, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word normal because I don't know what it's going to look like, but it will at least allow us to leave our homes, uh, maybe to go back to school in some way. Eventually that's going to happen. One of the uh, aspects of this crisis 
uh, around the corona virus that I think is, is incredibly important for those of us who think about accessibility issues to remember is that uh, there are innovations that went into place because of this crisis that literally went into place overnight. And many of the innovations that took place literally overnight, remote uh, um, transmission of teaching and learning uh, in schools, uh, in, in all areas of schools, um, working from home, etc. All of those issues virtually happened overnight. So many of these uh, changes have been the heart and soul of what the disability community has been lobbying for for literally centuries in the United States of America. And, and when, when I suggest that accessibility should not only be a foundational issue, but also a transformational issue, is that when we get back to the table, when we can see each other in, um, in person, one way or the other, with or without masks on, um, we are going to need to remember that by virtue of the coronavirus, anything and everything became possible, became doable. The very things that many of us heard, and, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll use the, the, uh, the context of a, an IEP team meeting, for those of you who may not be versed in, in uh, special education under IDEA, um, one of the most important aspects of the uh, Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act is the meeting amongst the child study team, representatives of the school, and most importantly, under IDEA, the parent or guardian of the child in question. And um, at those meetings, we often get into disagreements about what we can and cannot do. Well, I think the the, the transformational aspect of the times in which we live is that we are going to need to remember that we have now learned and realized that no is not an option anymore. Um, for, for there have been aspects of public education that have occurred as we speak um, that opened the door to the entire country overnight in the interests of health and safety. Um, and again, that, that I, I would very much like to emphasize uh, that were so many of the requests from people with disabilities um, to which they heard the answer no. So as we Re, as, as, as we consider what the future is going to look like, um, I would argue that this um, horrible time in which we're living um, has in fact created an opportunity for our governmental institutions to realize that, boy, oh boy, we can do whatever we need to do whenever we need to do it, because that's exactly what we've done here. Uh, the disabled community is going to remember how quickly innovations went into place um, for the general population, for the entire population, um, when uh, there were individuals with disabilities who had been lobbying, uh, working, um, advocating for these very same changes all along. And uh, therein lies the opportunity for transformation. Uh, therein also lies, and again, I will remind those of you who are listening, I am a lawyer. 
my trenches um, involve litigation and one way or the other, either suing or being sued. Um, I, I strongly urge governmental institutions, uh, school districts, higher education, uh, um, communities, uh, municip municipalities, to remember that uh, many of our population will be coming back from when we can leave our homes um, with a bittersweet uh, notion that uh, what was once always said to be uh, not able to be done was done in the name of the, the whole population. Um, and I think we, it'll be really important going forward for us to remember that, uh, lest we uh, have short memories um, and, and therein we will be caught. Um, I would argue that this gives us a license to be as creative, as, uh, as accommodating, um, to make, and, and, and not only accommodating, but um, in, the, in the transformational realm to also think about um, maybe rethinking what teaching and learning looks like, uh, given what we've gone through. Um, so some food for thought on the issue of a foundational aspect of accessibility um, and adding perhaps a transformational aspect of that, given the fact that we were so good in this past month at literally transforming our society overnight. Okay, um, and with that, I'm going to share with you, um, for those of you who may be educators in our audience, I'm gonna share with you a slide that is misspelled. Um, it, the slide itself says, Andrew Standard, uh, it should read standard. Um, there is a, an E in the word standard that shouldn't be there, my apologies. Um, and in, in 2017, a, uh, a unanimous United States Supreme Court um, came forward with uh, a nationwide standard for what a free, appropriate public education means for students with disabilities and what every school district is required to um, provide as a free appropriate public education. And that standard, uh, and I'm gonna read right from the slide, uh, that standard is, and I quote, and with the apologies, I'll read it straight out. To meet its substantive obligation under the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, a school must offer an IEP, an, individu an individual educational plan, reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. That is the nationwide standard. And the reason why the United States Supreme Court set forth that standard for the entire United States of America is because there were some jurisdictions in the country whose uh, uh, standard for complying with the obligation to provide a free appropriate public education um, was, was as, uh, was as low as uh, basically saying it has to be more than de minimis, something a little bit more than nothing. Um, and the United States Supreme Court found that to be totally out of sync with the letter and spirit of the IDEA, of the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act. So, Again, to meet its substantive obligation under the IDEA, a school must offer an IEP reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. I emphasize the, the fairly new because it was, it was uh, brought forth in 2017. Um, in, uh, I emphasize that standard uh, particularly to emphasize um, the aspect 
of that standard where it says a school must offer an IEP reasonably calculated. Now, some of us who are, uh, who are sharing this uh, little conversation today, uh, who, who are educators and who have been around the IEP team table, um, might remember that there have been times that uh, certain people have said things like, well, we don't have a requirement to offer you a Cadillac. Um, what, you know, our, our obligations to provide a free appropriate public education uh, are not uh, required to give the best. But in light of what we've just been through, and in a way to illuminate the point that I was making earlier about that we are in transformational times, where the court has said a school must offer an IEP reasonably, cal reasonably calculated to enable a child, I would argue that the concept of reasonableness has changed over this past month. And that as, as stated before, um, uh, child study team members, uh, child advocates, and by child advocates, I will start with the idea that there are, that first and foremost, child advocates are parents and guardians. Second of all, of course, the child themselves. Uh, third of all, uh, individuals who may be supporting um, uh, parents and guardians and children directly. And fourth are all the individuals associated with the school district as all being child advocates. We are all child advocates. And I would argue that the Andrew Standard has undergone a bit of a metamorphosis uh, given the uh, current crisis that we're in. Uh, because as I said before, um, this past month has shown us that we can do whatever we need to do in order to accommodate us all. So reasonably calculated in, in, on April 14th, 2020, um, the concept of what is reasonable is now much more, uh, has much more depth, breadth, possibility, imagination, et cetera. Um, also against that backdrop is um, I would like to just remind uh, those of you who are listening and or watching uh, that we are fortunate to live in a state uh, that has one of the most um, far-reaching uh, and um, expansive anti-discrimination laws in the country. It's called the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination, uh, subtitled uh, the LAD, using the acronym of the law. It's called the LAD. And um, the various uh, protected categories under the LAD certainly include mental or physical disability, including AIDS and HIV-related illnesses. Um, that protected category shares um, a, a, a list of nationality. Um, it, is, it is illegal um, in New Jersey to discriminate on the basis of nationality, ancestry, age, sex, including pregnancy and sexual harassment, marital status, domestic partnership or civil union status, affectional or sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, atypical hereditary cellular or blood trait, genetic information, liability for military service, and as I said before, mental or physical disability, including AIDS and HIV related illnesses. This is a very powerful law, the LAD is. Um, and for those of us who practice and who function in the public sector, uh, public education, municipalities. Um, the LAD is also one of those laws that has a, uh, an exception whereby an individual who believes that they, or, or individuals who believe that they are uh, um, being discriminated against um, in violation of the LAD uh, can sue for not only what are called compensatory damages, those damages to make us whole, to uh, um, 
bring us back to where we were before we were discriminated against, but also um, what are called punitive damages, uh, um, which are, which are as, as the term suggests, damages to punish us if we've done something really, really, really bad. Um, generally, uh, public entities are um, not subject to punitive damages, but under this law, we are. And they're, you know, they're, they're scary damages. They can, we often hear about verdicts, for example, where there might be a, uh, a verdict of, um, of $50,000 in, in compensatory damages and $500,000 in punitive damages, which are designed to make the wrongdoer think twice about doing it again and, and are also designed to make sure that our society at large hears that it is not good to violate this law. So the New, Jer New Jersey law against discrimination, very important to remember against the backdrop of accessibility issues. Um, also, um, uh, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act um, of 1973. Um, this is a law that requires federal agencies and, and state public agencies to make their electronic and information technology accessible to people with disabilities. Um, that is why, for example, that um, it is critical that we remember that our websites um, and indeed our PowerPoint presentations, which I need to apologize for in a moment, um, have to be under the New Jersey law against discrimination and the federal law applying to the entire country. Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act um, has to ensure that um, uh, all technology uh, is accessible to people with disabilities. Um, and in fact, there is a website, and I'll be sharing this entire uh, PowerPoint uh, with um, uh, Naomi with uh, uh, Disability of New Jersey. Um, you can audit your website accessibility using um, a, a, uh, um, a site, uh, http colon backslash backslash wave dot web aim, one word, dot org. Uh, and you'll see this. Um, when, when we get the final uh, PowerPoint. And uh, another uh, transformational foundational aspect of this conversation is that dis disabled users of technology don't measure accessibility. They measure, they measure usability, simply want to be able to use it. Um, why do we have the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination to Protect People with Disabilities and Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act to, to uh, make sure that all electronic, um, public uh, electronics are accessible because 6.4 million people in the US have a visual disability. 10.5 million people in the US have hearing disabilities. Um, 20.9 million people in the US have ambulatory disabilities, and 14.8 million people in the U.S. have cognitive disabilities. Um, um, just checking the time. Um, so uh, towards that end, it's very important to make sure that, uh, that our websites are accessible. Um, and indeed, again, for those of us who may be uh, teachers, um, uh, instructors in any way, and those of us working in the municipal sector, um, it doesn't only apply to our websites, but it also arguably, not, I mean, in fact, in law, um, applies to PowerPoint presentations so that when we are giving a presentation, we have to also remember uh, that um, uh, our PowerPoint presentations must be accessible. Uh, the apology I talked about before is that I attempted to um, download a program that would have made this PowerPoint itself uh, uh, um, ex more accessible. It will be, we'll work on it and we'll make sure that you get it. 
um, but I have a very old PowerPoint program on this particular computer, and um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to download it. For that, I sincerely apologize. There are standards uh, for website um, uh, accessibility, um, and and they they are based upon four principles. One is that the um, the medium has to be perceivable. Um, users must be able to perceive it in some way using one or more of their senses. Um, it must be perceivable. The second principle for website accessibility is it must be operable. Um, users must be able to control the elements, like buttons must be clickable in some way. Um, the mouse, keyboard, voice command, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. The third um, principle for website accessibility is that it has to be understandable. The content must be understandable to its users. And finally, uh, the fourth principle for website accessibility is that it must be robust. The content must be developed using well-adopted web standards that will work across different browsers. Again, that's that was part of my problem now and in the future. Um, and and the, the aspect of, of robust content, again, and I can't emphasize this enough, um, goes back to the concept of um, foundational a foundational attitude towards um, accessibility issues that we should be thinking about uh, people with disabilities as part of as initially part of the audience um, uh, to which we are imparting information um, a disability has nothing whatsoever to do with the um, need for the standards of whatever we are presenting to be as high as possible. And therein lies the foundational aspect. Therein lies the transformational aspect that these times have um, certainly um, demonstrated. Uh, so again, uh, the four principles, perceivable, operable, understandable and robust. Uh, four areas to, to make sure that we are complying with in order for our websites, our PowerPoints, and any other uh, media, uh, te technological media that we employ um, in order to uh, um, comply with Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act and the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination. Um, and there is also uh, a checklist. Um, there is a, uh, another website that is part of this uh, uh, presentation. Um, it is, it is uh, HTTPS colon two backslashes web aim, one word, W-E-B-A-I-M dot org backslash standards backslash W-C-A-G backslash and it's it's a bunch more that you'll be seeing and again my my apologies for the website um and then there's some other helpful resources that are on the checklist um in the uh two minutes that we have remaining uh i would like to just go back to uh frankly the the most important slide that um uh, I think we need to think about um, as we go through these uh, very trying, uh, kind of scary uh, times that we're in, um, and that is that that while all this is going on, there are dynamics of the situation uh, that should give us all pause. Uh, that as we think about going back that maybe this is the time to rethink what um, in the educational context teaching and learning looks like, in the employment context what employment looks like, uh, 
and and what the what the term accommodation uh, should mean in light of what we have all shown ourselves uh, we are able to do. Um, and uh, I, I can certainly say from the standpoint of lawyering in this area uh, that embracing the idea of accessibility and accommodation being a foundational and transformational issue uh, that that you would basically be uh, cutting down a tremendous amount of the work of lawyers uh, to maybe just doing educational issues as opposed to litigation issues um, and uh, everyone in our society would be uh, enjoying the fruits of everything we have to enjoy uh, without uh, the need um, to advocate as fiercely as, in this case, people with with disabilities have been forced to do. Um, I again want to thank uh, uh, Disability um, Rights New Jersey uh, for this privilege of spending a little bit of time with you. Um, my uh, um, my contact information is 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 on this PowerPoint which hopefully you'll have access to. And most importantly, I wish you all good health and safety and, uh, and thank you. <laughs>